Welcome to the Humanizing Work Mailbag, where we answer questions from the Humanizing Work community. If you've got a question you've been noodling on, email us at mailbag at humanizingwork.com and we'll see if we've got a good answer for you. Today's question is one we've both heard and experienced countless times. The framing of the question is a little bit longer than usual, but I think all the parts matter. So here's the question. My boss is asking us to deliver something on a timeline that feels impossible. Saying we can't do it feels like a bad career move. How do we deal with unrealistic timelines? Now, Richard, I've heard you tell a relevant story here. You know the one I'm talking about? Yep, the Merlin story. Uh, so some years ago, when my boys were younger, they're adults now, um, but we went through a brief period where we regularly watched the BBC Merlin TV show. Merlin, that one anyway, was a show about the famous wizard as a young man in an imaginary kingdom where magic was outlawed. Unfortunately, our time watching Merlin was pretty brief because we soon realized that pretty much every episode had the same story arc and the same resolution. Some calamity would befall the kingdom. People would try to do something about it, but their attempts would fail. Eventually, they'd go to the king asking for help to solve this impossible problem. We can't solve it, they'd say. And then the king would reply by pronouncing some flavor of, but we must. At that point, you might expect the people to say, yeah, sure, but like we just told you, we've tried and we can't do it. Uh, but no. The people would say, we can't solve this. And the king would declare, but we must. And the people would be like, okay, now it's possible. And they'd leave. And then what would actually happen is Merlin would secretly do some magic and solve the problem. Of course, this reinforced the king's belief that but we must was the catalyst that made things happen. And we see the same thing in organizations all the time. A team does some estimating and says something like, we can't complete all these features you've asked for by the scheduled release date. And then a leader says, but we must. And the team's like, okay, now it fits. But of course, nothing changed. The but we must pronouncement didn't make the work smaller. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. It's so frustrating because it's such a common pattern. I think, in fact, a lot of times we've trained our bosses the way that Merlin trained the king. Like, you make unreasonable demands and we do some heroics to get it done. And then, but we must, looks like it worked. And that's a takeaway that leaders either subconsciously or sometimes very consciously take from this. Like, ah, if we just push hard enough, if we just demand it, they get it done. And that's because it worked. <laughs> But it worked not because we were actually magical, but because we made hidden trade-offs that the boss didn't see. Uh, trade-offs to the technical quality or to sustainability or to our own personal relationships inside and outside of work. So when you're in this situation, like the original questioner, it's easy to feel like you're trapped, like you've only got bad options. Uh, early in my career, I, I think I was kind of a jerk about this. Uh, on the leadership circle, distance is my strongest reactive tendency. So it was easy for me to say, um, like, yeah, that's great that we must, but it doesn't fit. Like, I can't make it smaller just because you insist that it's smaller. And um, I'm not sure that actually helped. Um, later, I got more curious about what we actually could get done, which led to, I think, better conversations and ultimately um, splitting and going for 80-20. So a lot of my story splitting um, writing and like the story splitting poster and all of it really comes from this situation where we needed to be able to say, I understand there's something really important here. Um, we don't have enough capacity to do the thing you want us to do, but let's figure out what we can do. And so many times after that, we've discovered that we didn't need everything we originally thought we did in order to meet a larger business goal. Um, so these days, I use curiosity as my first go-to step because um, there's always more going on. The person insisting, but we must, is caught in the middle of something. So now I ask about that. Like, what makes the date particularly important? Or, oh man, what'll happen if we can't get it all done by that date? What's at risk for you? What's at risk for all of us? Starting with empathy towards the person demanding the unreasonable thing actually helps us get to a collaborative place for finding options. 
Yeah, I think as you share that, it's great to empathize with those leaders because the leaders in that situation probably also feel trapped. Like in situations like that, we, we found that there's a simple pattern that works really well, uh, which is you don't have to come up with the solution on your own, but you do need to communicate clearly about two things as a leader. Like what is the context? So you may know something that the, the teams, the individuals working on something don't know that's causing you to feel like we must do this by this time. And so share that context with them. Be as transparent and open about that as you possibly can. And then the second thing to share with them is your vision for the desired outcomes. What do you hope is true? Why would that be awesome if we could achieve that? And then the key move is not to then say, so please build all these features or please do this thing uh, so that That's we can- why you must. Yeah, so that we must do these things, but uh, to get them fired up about that vision and the key move there is to invite others in the organization to partner on how to solve the problem, which might lead to what you talked about, Richard. It might lead to what's the 80-20 solution? How could we split this? If we could only guarantee one part of this got done, what would we want to guarantee? And then if we can only guarantee a second thing and using those tools that we've learned in kind of the product management, product ownership space. The other thing to be hyper uh, vigilant for as a leader is the signals you send when you reward those teams that heroically get stuff done. Uh, this is an example of something that we call a culture signal, uh, signals that you send that really set the culture. So we've worked with organizations that rewarded these kinds of heroic acts with promotions or public kudos uh, at the all hands meeting or even in the press for people that went above and beyond heroically, uh, awarding bonuses or, or extra time off or some kind of rewards. And this perpetuates the cycle of expecting hero heroism because people recognize that, hey, to get recognized around here, to get these good incentives, you gotta be heroic. Uh, thinking of a product team that was given extra PTO after working lots of overtime to get something shipped on time, while other products on the same deadline worked really sustainably but didn't get rewarded it probably felt fair to the leaders to reward that team that had done all that overtime with some extra time off. That totally makes sense. Let's, let's allow some healing to take place. Didn't feel fair for the organization. And so people started to take the wrong lesson. If you want to get rewarded, just be a hero. So in those examples, leaders were trying to do the right thing. They're trying to acknowledge people that worked hard to accomplish an important outcome. But what we're discovering is that there are important things we can do as leaders that prevent the need for heroics. And we need to figure out how to send those kinds of culture signals. Well, did you find the answer helpful? Uh, would you give a different answer to people that are trying to deal with the impossible deadline? If so, let us know in the comments. And please like and share the video if you found it useful so more people can find it. And be sure to hit subscribe so you can get notified when we post new videos like this one. Thanks for joining us.